Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Barry Pollard. I am a web performance developer advocate in the Google Chrome team. And I'm here today to talk to you about our, our top core web vitals recommendations for 2023. Um, because there's a lot of performance advice out there. And we've heard some great stuff today. Um, first of all, you've got to figure out what you've got to measure. And we love our three-letter acronyms in uh, web performance. TTFB, by the way, is a three-letter acronym. The second T doesn't stand for anything. It doesn't really count. Um, we think in the Google Chrome team that we kind of solved this one with our Core Web Vitals initiative. We gave you three new three-letter acronyms that we think are a good way of measuring heuristically the, the page experience for your website. There's other metrics that you should measure, and business-specific metrics, and conversion options, and that sort of thing. But as an overall measure of how your user experience is, and to be able to compare to competitors, the three core web vitals are a great start. And we give you both the metrics and also um, the thresholds of where you should look at it, where we think you're good, where we think you need improvement, and where you think you're poor. So that's good. Um, now we know what to measure. Question next, then, is how do you actually improve your web performance? And there's lots of tools out there. You can plug your website into Lighthouse, and it will give you 53 performance audits and recommendations on what you can do to make your website faster. Um, Yellow Lab Tools is another fantastic tool. You run your, a, a URL through that, and it will give you lots of green um, traffic lights or red traffic lights and amber, again, where you can improve stuff. Web Page Test has 16 pages of detailed stats digging into your website and all the things that are right and wrong with it, and again, all the things that you can improve. And for those of you that have delved into Chrome DevTools, the performance panel has, um, let's just say, a lot of information in there. And it can be kind of overwhelming. So we've been thinking about this in the, the DevRel team and spent the last year trying to answer this question. What's the most important things for me to look at from my site to really move the needle in the core web vitals? And we want to consider that with a focus on three things. First of all, what are the recommendations that we believe will have the largest real-world impact? Because a lot of those tools will surface things that maybe aren't you know, optimal or could be done, but if it's not going to actually fix or change or, or noticeably move your Core Web Vitals metrics, then is it really something you should be concentrating on? Secondly, what are the recommendations that are relevant and applicable to most sites? So we're not looking at something very specific to video sites or React sites or WordPress sites, something like that. These are general recommendations that we believe all web developers can have a look at. And finally, what are the recommendations that are realistic for most developers to implement? Because there's a lot of hardcore web performance advice. Um, inlining CSS is a typical example that and can have fantastic improvements onto your website. But a lot of websites struggle to get that right. And actually, can, uh, with some of these things, you can cause performance regressions by doing it wrong. So we want to give something that's, you know, most of the web developers out there could actually, with a little bit of effort, implement them. So there's a lot to cover. Um, we got talk recommendations for each. We came up with three recommendations for LCP, three recommendations for CLS, and do you want to have a guess how many recommendations for FID? No, four. No, it was, yeah, <laughs> only joking, three. Yeah, so we've got nine recommendations here, hence the name of the talk. Come on, pay attention, people. Um, there's a lot to cover, not a lot of time, so let's get stuck in. So for our LCP recommendations, first up, our first recommendation is ensure that the LCP resource is discoverable from the HTML source. Um, when we look at the HTTP ar uh, archive and look at LCP elements, 70 to 80% of those elements are images, depending on its mobile or desktop. That's an extra resource that you need to fetch, you need to download, you need to code, and you need to uh, display. So there's an inherent delay to actually getting that um, HTML into it. So to understand how exactly those images resources, which are the vast majority of LCP elements, are done, we're going to delve a little bit into how browsers parse web pages and actually display images. Um, HTML is parsed line by line. This is a quote from a friend of mine, Harry Roberts, web performance expert. He has a fantastic talk, by the way. Check that out afterwards. I'll give you the slides at the end, by the way, um, where he delves into a bit more detail of what I'm going to talk about now. But I'm going to summarize some of it. It's not strictly true, by the way. It's bite by bite, chunk by chunk, whatever way you want to put it. But for ease of understanding, line by line of formatted HTML works pretty well. So we got a typical website here. This is for a web.dev article that I help look after. Um, fairly sort of standard. I've um, trimmed out some of the fat. But we got, the browser has to take this HTML code and turn it into a beautiful web page, a beautiful blog post. And the, person that's in, uh, the thing that's in charge of doing that 
uh, is this guy, the HTML parser, or the big dog, as I like to call him. Now, he's been around for a while. He's a bit long in the tooth. His eyes, you can see, aren't maybe the best, much like my own eyes. You can probably only just see what's directly in front of it. But he's a workhorse, and he will get the job done. He will take your code, and he will get that website done. Maybe not the quickest way, but he'll get through it. So he'll start going through it line by line. HTML, that's fantastic. That's what it's good at. Fantastic. Moving on, um, setting your language attribute. We're at a multilingual conference. Please do this. Helps with accessibility, including things like translation tools. Um, you go into the head. This is where your metadata is. So there's no content in here. This is all information to the browser about how your website should be loaded or, um, or displayed. Um, character sets, here we're using UTF-8. Most websites, I presume, should do that. Try and get that up near the top, because if the browser has read so far without with making an assumption that's UTF-8 and it's not, then it will start reprocessing from the beginning. Uh, viewport, this one is the default one that most of you should be using. Any of you that disable Zoom without a good reason, I hate you, by the way. And hate is a strong word, but my eyes, I told you, aren't that good. I need to be able to pinch them. So don't disable Zoom. Next, you get the title. This is the first bit of feedback that the browser can give to you, your user that the page is loading. The tab will display the title, the page will go white. We know we're off the old page and we're back on to, we're on to the news page. We're going to skip these. I promise I'll come back to them. But at this point, we get to a script. Now, that big dog doesn't know anything about JavaScript. So he can't do anything with this. He calls his mate the V8 engine, which will come in and deal with that. And he plods back to its kennel and starts gnawing on its bone. The V8 engine will come in, run the JavaScript, do whatever it needs to do, and then say, parser, come on back. He'll plod on slowly back. He'll see some CSS. Oh, I need to fix this. Network dude, I need some CSS. And he'll sit there and wait. Then some more CSS, and then you're done. The point is that HTML is parsed line by line. And it can often be paused. And that can make it really slow to actually render a website. Now, the truth is, browsers realized this a long time ago. And about 10 years ago, they introduced this guy, the preload scanner, or as I like to call him, the excitable little puppy. Now, this guy's quite young. He's not yet a teenager. He doesn't know how to parse the HTML. He doesn't know anything about. But the one thing he does do really well is fetch. And he just loves to run through HTML, grab all the sources that it needs, and send them to the network dude really quickly. So he'll race through this, find these five resources, and say, let's get these uh, teed up. So whenever the big dog comes along and gets these, he goes, I need it. Oh, you've got it already. Thank you very much. I need it. Oh, you've got that already. And this makes web browsing really, really fast. Um, you can see this if you put in a web page there or any sort of waterfall. You can see after the, the HTML is loaded, you immediately get those five resources all kind of loading at the same time. You don't get that step-by-step -step waterfall you used to see prior to this being introduced about 10 years ago. <coughs> My colleague Jeremy wrote this fantastic article called Don't Fight the, uh, the Browser Preload Scanner, giving lots of details about why it's good, why it's fast, and what you can should and shouldn't do um, to aid it. And I love the title as well. But you might think, OK, how would I fight the preload scanner? This is how you would fight the preload scanner. If this is the entirety of your web page, you've given nothing. You've given one resource, app.js. If you're hiding all your images, your fonts, your CSS inside your JavaScript, you're giving that little puppy absolutely nothing to work for. And you're really costing yourself in web performance. And like, why would you? Look at him. Look at his face. Come on. Why would you upset him? Give him something to play with. Give him something to do. Because that is honestly a really quick and easy way of making your websites fast. So don't, OK, you might think to yourself, OK, what if I need to execute JavaScript? It's a personalized website. Maybe it's a, a photo viewer, and you need to know what the person's login is to see what their photos are and not just play them to generic. And that's why we'll come back to these three lines. See, I promised you we'd come back to them. Um, preload hints that some people have talked about today. These, again, give that little puppy something to work on, something to do. Here we're loading um, a couple of fonts. We might not know what we're displaying yet, what characters we're doing, but we damn well know we're going to need these fonts. So we can go ahead and get started and download those. Similarly, web.dev uses an image CDN. So we do a pre-connect to that to connect there and say, not sure what image it is. Hopefully, it's in the HTML, and you're going to discover it soon anyway. But let's just get ahead and get uh, that domain connected to and take some of that resource out. 
So don't fight the preload scanner, particularly for your LCP image. Make your resources discoverable. Either ideally just put it into the HTML itself. If you can't, use a preload hint and try and get that started. Next up, ensure the LCP resource is prioritized. Because I'm going to let you into a little secret here that not many people might really want us to know. Browsers don't prioritize images initially. Um, if you take this, this is um, the independent.ie, an Irish newspaper website. I'm from Ireland, by the way. Um, so if you ignore the fact that Virgin Media has uh, taken over the whole homepage and that rather obtrusive little show notification thing, what do you think is the biggest bit or the most important thing in this page or the LCP element? Anyone? It's Zook. Let's play again. It's Zook. This meta human here, right in the middle. Yeah. So next we want to have a look and see in the waterfall where that image is actually requested. Yeah, some websites load an awful lot of stuff, most of which doesn't end up on screen. So we'll, we'll zoom in a little bit here. And you can see um, up in the top right, if my funky clicker works, we load the HTML. Um, after that, we preload a font. That's good. I told you what to do that. Next, we preload a font. Yeah, then we... One, two, three. Five, six, seven, eight. Okay, preloading 10 fonts seems a little excessive. I know they're print media, but that's a little over the top. Then at line 12, uh, 12 it loads the CSS. Now, luckily, the browser's been clever here. You can see it actually downloads that CSS a lot quicker than the fonts. So even though those got requested first, the browser's been clever enough to say, hey, no, the CSS is more important than those 10 fonts. So it goes ahead and gets those. But what's perhaps more interesting is that there's then this gap where the images aren't requested. It waits until the CSS comes. Um, and then whenever it does eventually request the image, it's got to wait behind all these fonts until the image itself actually starts to download. And that's because browsers fetch for resources in several steps. First up, they get the render blocking resources. Typically, that's your CSS, any synchronous JavaScript. Next, they'll get on-screen content. At that point, it goes, oh, shit, I need that image. Why didn't I get that image? Oh, my god, we should have got that image first. But it's a bit late then. It's already started drawing it. Um, after that, I'll get any off-screen content, anything below the page, kind of prioritized low. And the point is, images are not render blocking. They're not going to be in that first section. So there's an inherent delay um, to actually getting those image. And some of you are web performance geeks. I know you think the answer to this. And Robin kind of ruined this earlier, so I hope none of you were at his talk. You might think, hey, I'll just stick a preload hint in there. That's fantastic. That will do it and get the image first. Well, actually, no. You might be surprised to discover that that doesn't get the image that much faster um, anyway. Because that little puppy was going to run through the HTML. It was going to find your image anyway. And when it sees a preload, that doesn't mean get it fast. That means discover it early and get it appropriately. And the, the browser knows, we've sit there and told it, it's an image. And the browser knows, image, phase two, get to that in a minute. So preload won't help as much. It will get it above other images in the HTML, and there's certain things that will make it slightly easier. But in general, it doesn't speed things up as much as you think. The thing that does, however, is this. So this is a new API we launched last year called the Fetch Priority API. It used to be known as Priority Hints. We're trying to settle on one name because we figured two names was kind of confusing. Um, this is a really, really complicated API. I'm going to show you some code on the next page. Try not to get too scared. We'll walk through it. It's OK. This is what you need to do to use this API. That's it. That bit in red. You just add one attribute to HTML resource that you think is important, and you say fetch priority equals high. And that tells the browser, this is really important. Override your normal loading for it uh, and use this instead and get it high. Um, the, the difference that that can have is amazing. So Sento from uh, eBay tweeted this out near the end of last year. They saw an LC improvement of 150 milliseconds, easily one of the most effortless speed wins for us. Truly a one-line change. Now, you might think 150 milliseconds, not that much. Let's get over ourselves here. But eBay was already a website. Uh, already a, yeah, it was already a website. It was already a fast website as well. Um, so getting any sort of speed improvements there is pretty good. Getting 150 milliseconds is amazing. And doing that with a one-line code change is phenomenal. Um, one word of warning, Andy is running around the conference here. He, uh, I love this quote of his. It wasn't about fixed priority, but it still applies here. When we explicitly increase the priority of one resource, we implicitly decrease the priority of others. 
So use fetch priority to tell the browser about important things, but don't overuse it. One, two, three images tops, or three resources top. If you start putting fetch priority on all your images, or even all your on-screen images, you're telling the browser, none of this is important, fetch them all equally. What you want to do is say, this is the most important one, take this above all others. Um, moving on, use a CDN to optimize document and resource time to first byte. This is a bit of an older um, bit of web performance advice, but I think there's one sort of caveat that people don't do. Because again, back to our waterfall, until we get that HTML source with some details with it, uh, of what the other resources are, we can't load the rest of the waterfall. So getting that HTML resource is really important. And yeah, there's things like early hints that can help and stuff like that. Um, but even then, let's include that as part of the first response. And um, when we look at CDN usage, lots of sites are using CDNs, but they're mostly using them for third-party resources. So if you include a chat widget or Google Analytics or something like that, you're like, hey, I'm using a CDN. Or subdomains, so asset domains is quite popular, or uh, image CDNs. What very few websites, less than 30% do, is use the, uh, the CDN to serve the HTML document themselves. And to be honest, that's the most important one, the biggest benefit that you can get. So getting that close to your users, getting that time to first byte down, is going to have a bigger benefit than the other two combined. So really, if you're one of the 71% of websites that isn't using CDM for your HTML source, have a look at that. And if you are using it, but you're saying don't store it because it's always going back to the origin, have a think whether that needs to happen, whether it's all personalized content, whether you can store it for a short time. Um, you know, even five minutes will mean that lots of those hits don't go all the way back. Moving on, CLS. CLS is my favorite core web metric. That's the one where things shift around and we say that's bad and we give you a terrible score when things move around. Um, so it's all about stuff being presented on page, other stuff coming in, resizing, uh, content looking different. So the biggest bit of advice there is whenever you put it on page, put it on with the right size. And we traditionally said that about images. So using these width and height attributes, they fell out of favor whenever we came to responsive web design and we tried to size our images with CSS. But they're back in play now, because browsers will use this in combination with the CSS and size your images appropriately. Because without those attributes, this is the way a web page loads. You get your text, image, browser goes, I don't know what size this is. So I'm just going to play the text. You start reading the text, the image comes in, and it's like, oh, uh, I've lost my place here. With those attributes, the browser will leave aside space for those. And if you've got CSS, because you want a responsive design, so it's max width 100, height auto, it will then use that with those attributes to figure out what the appropriate height is. Still not great that the image takes a little bit of time to load, but at least you're not having that jarring, shifty um, thing going on. And if you're reading it, you can continue reading it. But it's not just images, and you need to look at other things. Ads are a big common uh, problem there, because ads often load late. Um, and again, the default size of an empty div is zero pixels. Now, I think we can all guarantee one thing. If you're going to display an ad on the page, it's not going to be zero pixels. So you can use min width to say, let's set the size this appropriately. Even if the ad ends up a little bit bigger, because um, you get different ads for different users, um, then um, it will still display that. Um, next is be eligible for the BF cache. So better than loading fast is loading instantly. Uh, and I have a workshop after this, by the way, plugged to myself. Um, so the BF cache, uh, what it does, I'll show you a quick, quick video here, is whenever you browse to a website and you browse away, it will keep that old website around, the fully loaded website, the fully rendered website with all the JavaScript executed, stuff like that. So on the left, we got a browser without the B, uh, with the BF cache, on the right, without. Um, we start on TechCrunch, we go to the BBC, and you can see it takes a little while to load the page, pretty much the same in both. But then if we go back to TechCrunch, you can see on the left it just loads instantly. On the right, it takes a little bit of time. And again, if you're like, oh, actually, I didn't finish reading the BBC, or there's an article a bit I still want to go, you go forward, and again, you see instant on the left, and takes a little bit of time on your right. Those all count as page loads, because your users see them as page loads. Crux sees them as page loads. Core Web Vitals sees them as page loads. So getting that free performance is fantastic. Um, and you might think, 
okay, but how many people actually do that is really common, particularly in certain sites. So e-commerce sites, you Google socks, you click on socks. No, I don't like those. Back, click on another one. Um, newspaper articles, you're reading articles back and forth. Oh, I forgot to pick up that bit of information. So we're showing about 10% of navigations on desktop and 20% on uh, mobile. I think it's gone down a little bit that, but a large proportion of your website page views will be these back forward cache views. Um, whenever we released the, the BF cache in Chrome, and I'll admit we were a little bit behind the times, Safari and Firefox had it for a few years. We only released ours just uh, about a year and a half ago. We saw a noticeable uptick in Core Web Vitals being passed by the website. And it was all due to back forward cache. We thought, and, and due to fixing CLS, we thought LCP would benefit from this, but it was actually CLS that saw the improvement. Um, there's a test in DevTools. You can just go in there, load your website, open up DevTools, application tab, click that blue button, it will go forward, it will come back, and then it will tell you any reasons why you can't use the back forward cache. Because some APIs, unload handlers are not, uh, a common one, setting cache control no store on your document, that say mm, it might be dangerous to load this web page, and we're not doing that. We are looking at both of those, by the way, just a word of warning and saying if that's still the right behavior to do. Um, to be re really egotistical and quote myself, I wrote an article on this before I joined Google, and I said, I honestly believe that sites that are ineligible for the back forward cache are giving up free web performance for their users and making passing core web vitals needlessly tough on themselves. So look at that. Um, next, avoid animations and transitions that use layout inducing CSS properties. Uh, we love animations, look at that. That's pretty impressive, isn't it, yeah? Um, if you'd animate that in by, anim by changing your top, bottom, left, right CSS property, that counts as CLS. That's even, by the way, and a lot of people don't realize that, even if it's outside of the normal document flow, it's position fixed. That will count that. The document still has to be re-rendered and recalculated. And quite often there's an easy fix to this. So the code on the left animates top, the code on the right uses transform, translate. They have the exact same effect, except the code on the right is much more performant. And for the purpose of this talk, more importantly, does not count for CLS. Now, there's a question of whether it should and all that, but there's lots of other performant reasons. This happens on the, uh, on the right, happens on the compositor layer. It's much more performant for the browser. It doesn't need to go to the main thread. It doesn't need to recalculate the whole thing. FID. Um, so FID is first input delay. I want to spend a little bit of time talking about FID. Um, some people mentioned this earlier. Um, when FID was first introduced, between 70 and 80 percent of mobile websites um, passed that. Quite, it was always quite high on desktop. Now we're at the point where it's nearly 100 percent of uh, websites on desktop and you know, not far off on mobile. Does that mean responsiveness is not an issue on the web today? It, I think we'll all agree it still is, particularly on mobile where it's painful. Um, so we're introducing a new metric, or we have introduced a new metric about a year ago, uh, better responsive metric, INP. Um, if, you click on, if you've got some stuff in the main thread, then you click on it, it's got a weight, then you go through the event handlers, then render and paint. FID measures this bit, and only for the first input. INP measures the whole interaction until the next paint, and it measures it across all interactions and gives you the worst one. Um, you can think of it in three phases. So input delay and processing times when it's processing JavaScript. Presentation de uh, delay is whenever you, know, you might be doing complicated renders. So to run these through these very quickly, because I'm running out of time, uh, avoid or break up wrong tasks. I'm going to give a shout out to Jeremy, who's uh, written a fantastic article on this. And just last night, dropped some more um, hints on this and more blog posts on that, so check those out. JavaScript is greedy by nature. So we've got a function here, and it's calling five sub-functions, and it's going through them. What, you've, you're happy, you've modularized your code, it's a nice way to do it, but JavaScript will actually execute all five, one after the other. What you need to do is put in a break there and tell JavaScript, you can take a break here, put these in a new task, and execute them whenever you get a chance. So here we use set timeout with a zero millisecond delay. So that says, schedule this again to happen in zero milliseconds. That doesn't mean it will happen in zero milliseconds. It will be put to the back of the queue. If there's anything ahead of it, it will go, but it will be scheduled in zero milliseconds. So use that for less critical work. Um, there's a couple of JavaScripts co coming out uh, there, M annoyingly mostly Chromium at the moment. We're doing a lot of work on it, and um, other browsers a little behind. Avoid unnecessary JavaScript. So we just love shoving JavaScript on our, our web pages. But you've got to ask, is it all needed? Does it, and is it all needed at load time? Um, 
Andy talked a lot about this, so I'll skip past this, but like, look at the third parties, look at Google Tag Manager, look at the content, when you can load it. Does it need to all be loaded at the beginning? Whenever everyone's at their fastest and trying to get um, all the stuff done, it's a bit of a car crash trying to get that web page loaded. And finally, um, avoid large rendering updates. And the biggest bit of advice that I can give in this is try and keep your DOM sizes small. Don't have lots of off-screen content that isn't shown there. Because a lot of JavaScript frameworks, particularly, you make one small change, they re-render the whole page. If you keep your size small, even if uh, re-renders the whole page, then that can be done quickly. Newer JavaScript, React 18 has got a lot of um, new APIs to try and help that. But that's the biggest bit of advice you can do. You can use CSS containment, say this bit of the web page isn't affected by this bit of the web page. If that changes, don't worry, you don't need to recalculate this. Um, and finally, avoid abusing the request animation frame API. So this runs every time there's an animation. Um, if you make that slow, you're making every animation slow. And you're taking that rendering time up. And those are the top nine recommendations we got. Um, we have a blog post on it with lots of links and lots of details. Um, and with that, thank you very much. And hope you learned something there. <laughs> So much on time, Barry. Uh, many thanks. Uh, so, any question uh, to, to, to Barry in English, please? Answer them all. Oh, oh. No, one at the back. Tout au fond, Audrey. Thank you. Uh, you're working on Crux, right? Yes. Okay. Um, do you know when uh, the ENP is going to be like an official metrics? Because right now, when I run audits on the website, it's like the actual uh, the, the worst metrics on all uh, core, uh, web vitals. So we've made no um, doubts in the Chrome team that we think FID, and as we talked about earlier, is kind of done its day. And we're really keen to get IMP in there. I can't tell you any dates. There's a lot of other things to it. There's particularly a, a, a combination with search and when they're happy to do with it. Um, I would keep an eye on it. I, I, I don't think it's that far. The one thing I will say is whenever we make it an official Core Web Vital, we will give a lead time. It's not like it's going to be a Core Web Vital and it's happening tomorrow. Bam. So you're going to get time to optimize it. But I wouldn't hold back. I'd look at it now. OK, thank you. Uh, the kind of time it will be around six months or one year? Or Second, sorry? The time you will give to us? Um, so we said, I'm trying to remember back to when the, uh, the original Core Web Vitals on. It's uh, six one months year. minimum, I think we said, um, more likely a year. So it's that sort of time frame that we're talking about whenever we need. Any other questions? Hmm. So you're pretty mean. Cool. One more plug for my workshop upstairs happening in about, well, as soon as I can get up the lift, um, up on the fourth floor. So if you want to learn about pre-rendering your pages, come on up there. And thank you very much for your time.